This is the story of how an ordinary young woman from an ordinary family became destined to be the future Queen of England. It seems like a fresh chapter, the beginning of something quite new. What you see is pretty much what you get. William and Kate have brought a real relevance to the monarchy. The royals never really lost popularity. Because the monarchy is uniquely trusted. It is above politics. She's possibly one of the most scrutinised royals ever. And one of the things that the young royals have done very successfully is to renew the royal brand abroad. Most of the nation has fallen in love with Kate. We are seeing a queen in waiting. Well, in, in terms of the Duchess of Cambridge, um, what you see is pretty much what you get. I've met Kate now on quite a few occasions. She's very kind, she's very thoughtful, um, she's very easy to get along with. I think she's been very well brought up. She comes from a lovely family. She's got two feet firmly on the ground and the people who know her well are very loyal to her and they, they you know, they love her. In one sense, Will and Kate marrying, it seems like a fresh chapter, the beginning of something quite new, and if you go back to when uh, uh, the present Queen married Prince Philip in, in November 1947, at, this, at that time it was thought to be a new beginning. And then later on people said, what happens when they get old? We'll get bored with them. We don't want them anymore. And um, particularly with the present Queen, who is now the longest reigning monarch in, in British history. On the contrary, uh, as her reign has gone on, the affection in which she's held gets deeper and not less. This suggests the monarchy has very deep roots and that these periodic refreshments of young blood do it nothing but good, but it still goes on just the same. Thank you very much. That's very I think William and Kate have brought a real relevance to the monarchy. Um, they're young, they're very good looking. Um, Kate certainly injected quite a lot of glamour. But more importantly, perhaps, they're working on subjects that are very relevant to the younger generation at the moment. So in their charity work, they're focusing on things like mental health, um, wildlife conservation, um, and even things like cyberbullying, which is a real modern day issue. The former Kate Middleton has done a remarkable job in being the wife of William. In almost every circumstance that she finds herself in, she acts with a charming combination of good nature and a proper sense of the dignity of the occasion. At some date in the future, Prince William will become king. Kate by his side will be Queen Consort. Well, there are two roles to a future queen. One is to produce heirs, which she has done, and one is to learn how to one day become queen, and, and that is very much what we are seeing. We are seeing a queen in waiting. Um, we are seeing uh, the Duchess take on more duties, more royal engagements, more of a public profile than ever before. She's taking on more patronages. She's taking on patronages from the Queen and from the Duke of Edinburgh. Now, this is all very deliberate, very much a part of the, the palace machine, bringing her from the, from the shadows of Anma into the forefront, into the spotlight, because they're very clever. They, they realise the power of Kate. They realise the potential of William and Kate as this young, glamorous, dynamic duo who actually do have the ability to reshape and project the monarchy into the future.
If you had asked me in the 1990s what I saw the future for the royal family as being, I would then have shared the pessimism about its longevity. Not because the opinion polls suggested that was right, because one of the things that people always misunderstand is even though there was the Annus Horribilis, even though there was that huge controversy around the, the collapse of um, the, the Charles and Diana marriage and, and in fact also other royal marriages, um, in spite of all of that, the royals never really lost popularity. Individual members did, but the family didn't, the queen didn't in any real way. There was always, there's never been really more than 25% Republican sentiment in this country. However, I would at that point have thought that the way in which the modern world was developing mitigated against a monarchy continuing well into the 21st century because we seemed to be entering a society that was more egalitarian and had more faith in the transformational effects of politics and was somehow kind of moving into a joyous modernity. And in fact, we've gone totally the other way and um, people have lost faith in politics so profoundly that that is actually, in a strange way, shored up and made much more important the position of the royal family. Obviously, whether you're a Republican or a Royalist, your view is going to differ, but um, when you see how the nation came together to celebrate the Queen's 90th birthday, there was no doubt in my mind that the United Kingdom loves its queen. There will always be people who say it's a waste of money. Well, you know, they cost us less than a pound a year in terms of upkeep. And I think they're worth every penny. And William and Kate very much are the future of the monarchy. I think monarchy is now more relevant in the early 21st century than it has been for many years. And I think the answer is because the monarchy is uniquely trusted. It is above politics and at a time when uh, public trust and respect for not just our politicians but many of the forces in society which hitherto had bound us together is beginning to break down. The monarchy is the one common point above uh, politics, above uh, suspicion. So I think as long as the monarchy can uh, keep a um, the sense of it being a, a family and a wholesome institution in place. Uh, the country is going to want to, not just at a, uh, a superficial level, but at a very profound emotional level, bond into uh, the monarchy as the representation of what it means to be British. Brooke Myers, blood of the garden. Yes, it's lovely to see children. And it's so nice. And have you got children in your side? I've got three boys actually. We've okay, seen them today for the first time, oh, but uh, they're very excited. How old are they? Uh, well, they're a little bit, they were, they were about the right age when we started the project. Yes. Now they're teenagers, just <laughs> hulking teenagers. So you have, have them in mind. Exactly, yeah. testing it out on the computer. Well, I think that Kate's family background has been a gr very helpful to the image of the monarchy and to William and Kate. It's that happy family, that, you know, everybody getting along well, being supportive of each other, which the, the Middletons are. And I think that that's been a, a considerable help. The fact that she's young and she's known only the years of peace um, and relative prosperity um, might suggest that, you know, she hasn't uh, got that kind of experience of life. But then if you look at her family, you'll see that it's really much more interesting and reflects such a huge variety of English history. Her grandfather was an RAF pilot in World War II, helped to nudge the wings of the V1s uh, when they came over London, away from, uh, away from London. Her grandmother was at Bletchley with her twin sister and um, received the news of the Japanese surrender. And you can trace all the way back the, the, the idea that uh, 
to be middle classes to come from nowhere. They come from a great number of different parts of, um, of English history. And so, you know, she, she, is, not, she is not from nowhere. Um, you can trace her way, all the way back, her ancestry, back to Harry Hotspur, who died in the Wars of the Roses. Um, so this is, this is a family, like many families, um, who have deep roots in the nation's history. And the fact that she's young is nothing but a good thing. Well, we must always remember that Catherine's great-great-grandfather was a miner, a coal miner, in County Durham, in fact. He worked in a mine beneath Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother's estate in County Durham. It's a romantic connection there. Do you guys do sit here for hours as well? Yeah. I'm sorry, it's pretty freezing. Yeah. It's the windiest place in Dundee. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been in the cadet school? Uh, five years now. Yeah. It's quite something to think that they had to climb all the way up to the top all the time. Well, they only lost one, one seaman in the first expedition, and he was in the crow's nest and fell from it. Well, William guards the privacy of his family, um, I think, more highly than anything else in his life. And it doesn't take a psychologist to work out why. You only need to look at William's own background, his relationship with his mother, what happened to his mother, um, the untimely death, preceding that, the breakdown of the Wells' marriage, everything played out in the media, poured over in the press, and he hated it. And you can completely understand why all he wants is a quiet family life out of the spotlight. I think the Pet Palace take a great deal of care of William and Kate, and I don't think they make them do too much or take them away from their children too much. I think that they have a really, you know, modern, sympathetic view. But I think he really understands that there's a huge uh, public interest in their lives and affection towards them as a result of that, and, and that the media is necessary, um, certainly when it comes to conveying messages. I think he totally understands that it's, it's a vital tool for him. The Kensington Palace has you know, warned against the use of paparazzi photographs um, of the children in particular although they're still being taken quite frequently. There aren't any UK publications who will use them. And I think that's probably helped a great deal to, to reassure him. Instead, we have um, William and Kate choosing when they want to issue photographs of the children. have taken George on a public engagement in the UK for the first time. Um, he went to the Royal Military Air Tattoo with his parents um, and I think that's something we're going to see increasingly. So I think it's very much a case of him wanting to protect them while they're very young um, and just do things in a way that he feels comfortable with. One of the very first things I noticed about Kate was the way in which she is not like the mother-in-law she never met. And I think that will actually help her a lot, both in, in her sort of non-role as, as queen-in-waiting and, and eventually as queen. She is extraordinarily self-possessed, somebody who's very comfortable in who she is and very self-assured which just with that level of, of um, attention she gets is incredibly important. So I think that self-possession, that self-confidence, that sense of who she is will be extraordinarily useful. When I first visited the hospice in Milton, I had a preconceived idea as to what to expect. Far from being a clinical, depressing place for sick children, it was a home. 
Most importantly, it was a family home. A happy place of stability, support and care. It was a place of fun. Uh, I see Kate's confidence increasing um, as she gains in experience over the years. Um, she's going to be speaking more in public. Um, she's in a difficult situation because I think she's not always able to be completely spontaneous in front of the cameras. And you have to remember that she's possibly one of the most scrutinised royals ever um, because of the rise of smartphones and social media. Um, any tiny slip up or mistake she might make could go viral within seconds. Um, and she must be really conscious of that, which, which must be a challenge. Um, but when you see her interacting and engaging with people up close, you know, you, real, you really get a sense of warmth um, and of genuine interest. Uh, she's someone who does a lot of research. She reads up on everything um, to do with the charity she's visiting. Um, and I think to the people she's engaging with, that must really come across well. Kate has shown herself to be a wonderful addition to the royal family. In a more egalitarian society, Kate has the natural connection with ordinary people that may well prove to be both the salvation and preservation of the monarchy. I think the times we see Kate really relaxing are quite often um, the most informal moments when she's getting involved in some kind of sporting activity, particularly when she's competing with William at something, um, or when she's uh, interacting with small children and you get these fantastic fun facial expressions. She looks to be really enjoying herself. I think that's when you can really imagine what she's like behind closed doors. The idea that Kate will drift away from her family into an exclusively royal life seems to me to misunderstand what's happened. What's happened is a permanent removal of the old barriers and, a, if you like, a domestication of the, of, 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 of the idea of, 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 of royalty and that she will be able to bask happily amongst her family for, for the rest of her days. And, um, so to that extent, we have moved um, into a much less uh, magical uh, era of monarchy, one in which they seem to be much more people like us leaving, leading lives like us, though of course they don't lead lives exactly like us. I think far from uh, this being uh, something which will weaken the hold of the monarchy upon the public imagination, I should have thought it would, would strengthen it. Yeah, I, I think very much there is a feeling in the palace that they want to learn from the mistakes of the past. Um, they didn't want a royal bride who felt isolated and lonely and cut off from her family and miserable because that has happened before and they didn't want a repeat of Diana. So I definitely think courtiers were, were determined that, that Kate should marry into the family feeling as comfortable as possible and I just think William wasn't going to take any chances. And he adores the Middletons. He has a very close relationship with Michael and with Carol so he also didn't want them to be sidelined as soon as Kate married into the family. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there'd be any need for her to distance uh, herself from her family. They're obviously very important to both William and Kate, um, and they've really been accepted into the royal fold, if you like. And we've seen the Queen driving Carol Middleton around at Balmoral, pointing out sights to her. They're obviously very comfortable in each other's company. Um, the family have also enjoyed, you know, lunches at Sandringham, and they've stayed at Prince Charles's Burke Hall home. Um, they're very much welcomed into the fold, and I don't see any reason why that would change in future. I think that William found the home life of the Middletons tremendously reassuring and appealing, and I think that's 
an atmosphere he wanted to reproduce in his own home. And I think that's been very important to him. In previous generations, the imperious tug of the court would have ensured that the, the incoming princess would have been swept up into the, in, into the court uh, with all its protocol and formality. And this clearly hasn't happened in this case. And obviously, the fact that the Middle, Middletons are uh, uh, clearly a happy family unit has, has a lot to do with it. I think, again, that's, that is a sign of general change, uh, because I think in previous generations, the, um, uh, the new princess would have been pulled into the court much more. Um, and indeed, um, that happened vice versa uh, with, um, with Prince Philip, who found, felt that he was becoming a mere appendage. Uh, but he, of course, had no home at all. And you have to remember that he came from a home which was broken in the most spectacular way, that his, his mother became a a nun, and uh, his father became a playboy in the Riviera, and he had no family at all. There couldn't be a greater contrast between that and, 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 and Kate Middleton's upbringing. Kate has provided William with a stable family life, one that he himself never had, and one that he values enormously. Much as he loved his mother Diana, and much as he still loves his father Prince Charles, William never knew the simple pleasures of a warm, settled and happy family life. I think that Kate's um, influence on William has been very, very important. I think that he was quite seriously affected by the bad relationship of his parents. And I think that Kate has strengthened him. Harry, of course, bounces along anyway, but I think William was more sensitive and more affected by, say, the suffering of his mother. And I think that Kate has provided the necessary, like, stability for him. When I was growing up, I was very lucky. My family was the most important thing to me. They provided me with somewhere safe to grow and learn. And I know I was fortunate not to have been confronted by serious adversity at a young age. For some children, maybe there are some here today, I know that life can sometimes feel difficult and full of challenges. I think that every child should have people around them to show them love, and to show them kindness and nurture them as they grow. Don't be under the illusion that she's a wallflower because she's not. She's very strong, she's very confident and I think she has a real clarity of vision um, and I think William depends on that hugely. So she has brought a huge amount to William's life. She has filled William's life with love and happiness and security and she's given him the family life through her own family. Just regular things that he never got to enjoy but he is enjoying now, and I think she's made him incredibly happy. William and Kate's marriage is very much a love match, and I think they seem incredibly happy together. You can see a huge amount of affection between them on engagements, you know, there's often an arm around one another, the looks that they share, um, and I hope that's going to last. I think they've certainly, you know, got a fantastic example in the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And I think because William experienced um, his parents' difficult marriage, he's very keen um, to not repeat that scenario. Um, and I don't think that it will ever happen. Kate has hugely boosted the popularity of the monarchy. Um, I think people find it very appealing that she's someone from a, an ordinary background who has joined the ranks, if you like, and is perhaps able to, to bring 
um, her experience of of a so-called normal life to the royal family, and it's it's something I think that particularly William really appreciates. Um, he's always said that he wants to give their children as normal a, an upbringing as possible. Oh, how's that? Look, she's going to put a mean. She's got a mean nice <laughs> Give her a straight first. Give her a straight and you The Windsors are, among other things, a brand, and brands need renewal. And one of the things that the young royals have done very successfully is to renew the royal brand abroad. If you look at the kinds of crowds that their trips attract, it is extraordinary. Um, the younger royals can do that in a way that the older ones cannot. Um, I include in that Prince Harry. I, I travelled to the US with David Cameron in 2013 and I was in New York with David Cameron when we met up with Prince Harry and there was this extraordinary scene um, somewhere in the middle of Manhattan where um, Prince Harry sort of suddenly came around the corner and I'm standing there with the Prime Minister, then Prime Minister of the UK. And there was a screeching like we'd get with a Beatles concert in the, in the 1960s. <laughs> and um, the thing about that is that sort of rock star appeal that the younger ones have it's incredibly detached from who they are as people, but it is also incredibly potent and you see it in the level of coverage they get, not just the crowds they attract, but, but the amount of column inches. So yes, clearly that has an impact on the brand and in the sense that the brand is most closely identified with Britain. Well, when she is queen, she's going to be queen of a very modern world, and I think it's going to help her hugely that she hasn't come from blue-blooded aristocracy and, and a background perhaps that people cannot relate to. She comes from a very hard-working family who have you know, climbed up the echelons of society from you know, working class to the very top. Um, she hasn't got above her station. She's, she is very approachable. That air of normality and ordinariness that you see in her, I think is, is what makes her real to people. She's very solid, she's very consistent, she's incredibly loyal, she's incredibly discreet. All of these things that we've seen over the years, she's been an amazing companion and girlfriend and now wife to William. They are a partnership. She also has an innate understanding of what she's married into um, and that sense of duty that I suspect that those 10 years of dating Prince William were probably enough to make her realise exactly what life was going to consist of. She had time to know whether or not she was cut out for it but William was very lucky that she did have those characteristics which not everyone does. Kate has a natural sympathy and connection with the public. It is unusual for someone so young to possess so many qualities that combine charm with graciousness. I just want to say how delighted I am to be here this evening to celebrate the fantastic work of the National Portrait Gallery. The gallery's achievements are exceptional. They hold the most extensive collection of portraits in the world, and their unique and brilliant exhibitions never fail to inspire us all. She's, um, she's the sort of girl who will walk into a room and light that room up. Um, not in the same way that Diana did. Diana was a head turner. She was, you know, she was the glamour girl. She dazzled in diamonds. Kate is more understated, but there is a, a warmth about her and something incredibly appealing. Um, and all of those are going to be things that stand her in, I think, in very good stead for her future role. Uh, Kate might not have the blue blood of uh, the aristocratic uh, monarchy, but she has every bit uh, in her character and behavior, uh, the um, virtues of monarchy uh, all around the world at its very best, and uh, I'm sure that uh, William married her, uh, not thinking 
uh, whether she was a uh, royal family member or not, but because he fell in love with her. And uh, who can blame him? Most of the nation has fallen in love with Kate. <laughs> I don't think that there's anything at this stage that I could teach Kate about being a member of the royal family because she clearly took to it very quickly, but she also had this very interesting period in her relationship with the prince where they split up and then got back together again, which was very clearly a a testing period, a proving period, something where she'd already been through the baptism of fire in terms of what it meant for destroying any chance of a private life she would ever have. And she went into it in that sense with her eyes open. The one thing I suppose she may not have known and will now know very well is just how peculiar royal life is. It is the strangest place that I have ever spent time in the palaces. Just that sense of never, ever really being alone. And the the palaces are sort of strange old buildings that are all about actually being built for show, for people to look inwards. And so they're really not about comfort, they're really not about family life. So by now she knows that. By now she knows the peculiarities of the etiquette. Um, the, ro the young royals have dispensed with some of it in a way that Prince Charles, for example, has not. He still insists that not only that his staff call him sir and curtsy or bow, but actually many of his friends do. I think that what William saw in Kate was a woman who would never leave him and that she had that sense of uh, faithfulness to him which would endure all their lives and given his own experience of his parents' turbulent marriage, I think something deep inside him was calling him and saying, I don't want that for my marriage. I want to be with somebody who I can be together with when I'm 90. I think the monarch has changed a great deal in the last century. Um, I think since World War II particularly, uh, the private sectors and the palace they have a big sense of PR nowadays, which they certainly didn't. I remember the Queen, she had a press secretary who said to a group of American journalists, I'm not what you journalists would call a public relations man. That was the press secretary speaking. So there was that mentality, very sort of built-in mentality at the palace, not necessarily by the Queen herself. But that has changed a great deal, particularly after the Annus Horribilis, when Diana died. I think that gave the system a big shock. And I think that it shook them into a more modern approach. I think the life and death of Princess Diana is, 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 is simply a, a tragedy whose seeds were laid, uh, uh, seeds were sown uh, even before she met, met Prince Charles. I think she, she, had a, she had a very bad start in life uh, and things went badly wrong and went badly wrong in the most uh, public way imaginable and the, the funeral of Diana was one of the most heartbreaking events in, in, um, in British life in, in the whole, whole of the last century, and everyone felt this. Uh, uh, and uh, I think, although it's, she's now not spoken of nearly so much, I think 
it was quite a trauma whose effect is still being felt. William and Kate, I think, have inherited an interest, a passion from Charles of being extraordinarily interested in the least well-off, the least uh, financially prosperous, but also those who are suffering. And it clearly touches the hearts of both William and Kate. Um, this is utterly genuine and they want to use the authority of their offices, their status, to see if they can touch the lives of those who are mentally suffering and try to bring them some light, some release, some joy into their troubled lives. Catherine, Harry and I have decided that we can use our positions to make a difference on the subject of mental health. It should not be a taboo subject in the year 2016. The Heads Together campaign is all about getting people talking about the hard times that many of us will face and have faced in our lives. Tonight, we're celebrating a truly remarkable work taking place across place to schools in support of children's mental health. Without many of the inspiring people gathered here this evening, countless of children would not receive the transformational support in their schools. It is because of so many of you here tonight that in their time of need, children have the help, care and attention that will get them through the tough times in their lives. Um, I think it's really quite a brave move. These are subjects that traditionally have been fairly taboo. Um, they're talking about really difficult things such as suicide and addiction, um, bullying, and I think it's really um, been very important to bring it out to the fore and get people talking about it. And you can see, um, you can see the genuine concern. We had a, um, an incident recently where Prince William um, comforted uh, a, a young man who had lost his mother recently, and obviously you could see that his empathy is genuine. He's been through the same thing. But that's incredibly powerful thing to be able to do, to go and uh, bring their own experience and share it with others um, and, and let them know that it is okay to talk about these things. It seems to me an enormous challenge for all of the young royals, but in particular for William and Kate, to find a way to do the empathy thing, to do what they they you know seen as being their core role in terms of um, performing a, a charitable role and um, maintaining something that they are clearly setting out to do which is redefining how much of themselves they make public they are trying to and i'm by the way very sympathetic to them on this they are trying to carve out a space for themselves to have a private family life they are also, I think, very interestingly positioning themselves for the age that they are in the era in which they are in the public eye, which is, of course, a social media saturated Instagram selfie era where they are in some way going very much against the tide on that. Um, trying to reclaim something for themselves. Now, I think that is potentially quite a clever thing to do in the long run. In the short term, it is inciting the ire of the press, so they're getting a more negative press as a result because the press feel um, shut out, and you see some quite silly and nasty reporting as a result. Um, but there is also the danger that they just end up looking like they're not doing very much, which, of course, is the big criticism. Uh, there's absolutely, it, it has been the case that William and Kate have been given some breathing space and um, some time out to 
enjoy being married, to have children. Um, and I think that does come down from experience. I mean, Charles and Diana were thrown into the thrust of royal life. You know, weeks after their wedding, they were touring around the world. Diana became an international celebrity overnight, totally eclipsed Charles. No one wants to see history repeating itself in that respect. And so what you have seen is a far more controlled release of, of William and Kate into the public domain. It hasn't just been an explosion. You know, after the royal wedding, they went to Canada and then things settled down. So there are tours and um, there are engagements. All over the world, the visits of Kate and Prince William have led to a renewed enthusiasm for the royal presence abroad. Heads of state are pleased to welcome the royal couple everywhere and audiences are clearly charmed by Kate. The busy foreign tour programme of William and Kate I think became even more important after Britain decided in the uh, referendum vote to leave the European Union. And what better emblem rather than uh, the uh, Prime Minister of the day, the come and go Prime Ministers who uh, pitch up uh, but are little known by the public in these far off lands, but the images of Kate and William are known every bit across the world. So they have an extraordinarily valuable role to play in ensuring that the future of Britain in the uncertain world into which we're going to be going will be as, uh, as good, as strong and as high as possible. Um, William and Kate are already travelling a great deal throughout the world. They're visiting many of the realms and countries that they're going to be visiting for decades to come. Um, and their visits are enormously popular. But Kate in particular seems to really capture the international imagination. She has fans all over the world. Um, that's going to stand her in great stead uh, in years to come. And she's going to be able to grow this, you know, soft diplomatic power, um, which would be perfect for her role as queen. One of the things that has been very interesting for me, because I covered the royals for such a long time, you know, I first started covering the royals in the, I guess, early 90s and covered them, you know, right the way through to now. So I've seen the evolution of royal press management and I have seen in it, it become much more sophisticated, much more aware of uh, the issues, but they even so cannot even begin to keep up with what's going on in the development of the press and the development of the world at the same time. In the early days and why they got so blindsided by having Princess Diana there actually working against them and doing her own, having her own direct line to the press. But in that era, that, that was the end of the era of deference where, you know, you could say to an editor, don't run this, and an editor would not run it, you could put out statements and say we will not answer any more questions on this and that would be the end of a story. The, that is so far gone, that was, the royals themselves helped to blow that out of the water, the, the collapse of the royal marriage. And so now you have them operating in this take no prisoners environment where even if the royal press managers can stop the mainstream media from reporting things that they don't want or can encourage them to report things that they do want. They have no control, control over the wider online world. And um, that is huge and it, and it also presents very new and big challenges for the royals.
there's a strange belief that the uh, young have no interest in ceremonial or in the past. And I've lost count of the times in which uh, people have said, oh, let's um, stop doing this commemoration, um, the Remembrance Day or whatever it is, because it won't appeal to the young. Um, and the same is true of the monarchy, that this is a, a, an institution whose roots uh, lie too far in the past to interest the young. But every time, every generation proves this to be wrong, and that the crowds at Remembrance Day and at, uh, at royal events remain um, as large as ever and as filled with the young as ever, because the idea that the young have no sense of the past um, is, is one of the greatest of all modern illusions. The current position of the monarchy in Britain was pretty much defined by uh, Queen Elizabeth II and by her father George VI as the focal point for the nation, not just at times of crisis and war, but at times of reflection, but even in a day-to-day -day way. There's a sense in the British public that they have an almost religious uh, reverence for uh, the monarchy in a way that they would never have for the political masters. Well, I think the royal family is in a very unique position in that, uh, you know, the Queen is, is on the throne because it was her God-given right. But I think that that is now seen as quite an antiquated concept. I think certainly if we're looking into the future towards King William and Queen Catherine, um, it's not going to be seen as a God-given right. They're going to need to justify being there. They are going to need to be a king and queen of the people, figureheads, representatives for the UK, hard-working members of the royal family. And actually, one has to respect the queen hugely for that because I don't think she takes her position for granted at all. It's the image that is being cultivated of William and Kate now it's going to be very important several years down the line because all of this will reflect our opinions of them as a future king and queen. My prediction, I'm happy to make a prediction, is that you will see the royal family continuing, but the royal family slimming down and slimming down and paying more and more attention to looking like value for money. And what sort of queen will Kate be? Will her easygoing manner be an enormous change to the style of the British monarchy? The memory of Princess Diana shines down as an alternative way of being royal that tragically was never to find full expression. Will Kate be very different as Queen to what Diana might have been? And how different a court will Kate preside over with King William to that of the court of the present Queen? Kate has that rare ability, possessed by very few people, of being able to talk to, speak to, relate to those of utterly different ages, backgrounds, ethnicities. It's a, a magical talent that uh, is uh, infinitely precious, really. And you either have it, I think, in life, or you don't. Uh, most people don't, Kate does. It's impossible to tell what sort of queen uh, she'd be like. We can only ob observe what we, we see and read. Um, but she seems to be a, a rather modest, cautious sort of person uh, who's un unlikely to uh, endanger the monarchy. And um, I should have thought she would be a kind of reassuring presence, but who knows what, what the future will bring. Oh, I think, I think Kate will make a dignified queen. It's very hard to imagine her sort of emerging in, in a sort of social activist role like her father-in-law or anything like that. Um, I think, you know, in terms of what people expect of a queen, as the current queen has defined it, she'll be quite close to that same model. I think Kate's going to make a fantastic queen. I think um, she is hugely interested in the causes that she supports, and I can imagine her giving that level of commitment 
to the role in future. She's got great diplomatic power. Um, she's hugely admired across the world. Well, when Kate does become queen, she will have had decades of experience within the royal family. So the fact that she wasn't born blue-blooded will not matter at all. In fact, it will be that that stands her in the best possible stead. She will have the advantages of both worlds, that experience of royalty and having been born an ordinary girl from the home counties. It's a perfect combination. Thank you.